Welcome everyone to lecture eight of this series on fluids and electrolytes. These lectures are accompanying my book, Manual Fluid, Electrolyte, and Acid-Based Disorders, A Pathophysiologic Approach to Common Clinical Problems. I am Dr. Mohamed Tinawi. I am a nephrologist in Northwest Indiana. This is the book. You can find more information in the description. It's available on Amazon in uh, paperback and also as an e-copy. We're still discussing chapter one, disorders of water balance, hyponatremia and hypernatremia. And this is part eight. And this is actually the last lecture on hyponatremia. After today, we'll start with hypernatremia and then we'll do clinical cases in both hyponatremia and hypernatremia. We're still discussing management, and this is episode three on management. If you have not watched episode one and episode two, please watch those first and then jump in to this one. We're still discussing general principles in the management of hyponatremia. What about free water restriction? This is used very, very commonly. It is very reasonable and useful in patients with euvolemic and hypervolemic hyponatremia. If someone is hypovolemic, is dehydrated, uh, such as hyponatremia due to uh, uh, diarrhea or vomiting, there's no point in fluid restrict restricting them. You give them uh, saline and usually they do well quickly and uh, there's no point in restricting water. Now, uh, many clinicians are fond of severe water restriction. Actually, when you go beyond 1,200, it's very severe. Uh, I consider it almost cruel. Just try it and see what happens. Uh, the compliance is very poor. Patient complains a lot. So personally, I do 1400. I rarely go beyond 1400 and yet I get numerous complaints. At any rate, um, a reasonable water restriction target is 500 ml below current urine output. Now, you have to understand that water restriction alone is unlikely to be effective in two clinical scenarios. If urine osmolality is high, is above 500 milliosmol per kilogram of water, or if the sum of urine sodium and potassium exceeds serum sodium, meaning if the patient is really concentrating the urine, if they're getting rid of the salt and retaining the water. In these two situations, water restriction alone is not going to be effective. Now, if you have someone with severe hyponatremia, especially if they're asymptomatic, if you have serum sodium below 125, you're not just going to do water restriction. It's inappropriate. You have to treat them. You have to give saline or 3% saline uh, in appropriate clinical scenarios, maybe tolvaptan, stop offending medication, etc. You don't just start water restriction and sit and hope for the best. Yet, in a large study, in a large registry of over 3,000 hospitalized patients with hyponatremia, sodium below 130, fluid restriction was the most commonly used treatment, followed by saline. Rarely, 7% of patients only got tolvaptan or 3% saline. So what, what's going to happen? The patient is going to stay in the hospital longer, you're going to increase length of stay, and they're going to leave the hospital hyponatremic. So don't just do water restriction. In some cases with really mild, chronic, recurrent hyponatremia, it is appropriate. It's inappropriate for severe cases. Let's move on to exercise hyponatremia. Exercise hyponatremia is increasingly recognized in athletes. Why? Because there has been many recommendations to drink a lot, to drink an insane amount of fluids, to hydrate. And that, uh, when, when you do that before a strenuous physical activity like marathon running, what's going to happen? Because of the stress, there are going to be a release of ADH, of vasopressin. This is non-osmotic release. And when the person drinks a lot of water, an insane amount of water, what's going to happen to this water is going to be retained and you're going to have acute severe hyponatremia. In severe cases, and there has been many reports of collapse, delirium, and even seizures. So what's the solution? We recommend to drink to thirst, not to drink an insane amount of water for no apparent reason. There is no need for that. There's no rationale for that. 
So how do we treat these patients, uh, whether on the scene or in a hospital or a medical tent? You need to establish an IV. Then you need to give 3% saline. Well, in, in these cases, um, you may not have enough time for serum sodium to come back. You're just suspecting that this is the case. So you give 100 ml of 3% saline quickly over 15 to 30 minutes. What's this going to do is going to raise serum sodium by four to six equivalents per liter. If the patient is still having problems like seizures and such, you can repeat that 10 minutes later. Now, the recommended correction of no more than eight per 24 hours, we said mo most patients like uh, four to six um, if, if they're at risk for osmotic demyelination, uh, otherwise, 6 to 8 is reasonable, um, and 10 is the cutoff per day, and for second day, 8. So all these targets and limits still apply. So what are we going to do? Let's say that we corrected sodium by 5 in the first 30 minutes. It means that for the next 24 hours, we should not raise sodium by more than 3. So what matters is the total correction in 24 hours. So if you correct really fast, in the first 30 minutes or in the third or, or in the first hour you continue the correction maintaining the same goal okay so if if sodium went up by four in the first hour then what are we going to do in the next 23 hours we only need to raise sodium by another four now this is a very important topic what do we do in case of overcorrection of hyponatremia? Now, this is, this is very common. I can tell you over the years, I've treated hundreds of cases of hyponatremia, and I calculate, I check labs, etc. And yet, sometimes you overcorrect. Why? Because you cannot predict what's going to happen with urine output. You give the solution based on certain calculations, but some people start to diaries, so you can get overcorrection. So, what do we do? Now, we need to do something if the correction is more than 8 in the first 24 hours, especially if uh, more than 10 to 12, then you really have to do something. This matters more if initial sodium is less than 120. In other words, let's say that you started with a sodium of 105 and it goes to 120. This is a, uh, this is a, a, a rise in sodium by 15. This is very significant. This is not the same like starting with a sodium of 130, for example, and it went to 138. Well, okay, 130 is, is close enough to normal, and 138 is, is no big deal. Probably I wouldn't do anything. So what do we do? Needless to say, you have to discontinue all sodium solutions, 3% or 0.9 saline, and tolvaptan. Now, this is what I do personally. When I give Tolvaptan or Samska, I write for one dose at a time. I never, ever write it on a daily basis. I never write Tolvaptan 15 milligrams a day. I want to evaluate the sodium, and then I give one dose at a time. I really recommend that. Second recommendation, whenever I give 3% saline, I put a time limit on it. I say give 15 ml for 20 hours or 20 ml for 15 hours give 300 cc's only. And now with the new uh, electronic medical records, it's very easy to, to put uh, the, the exact amount, to put a stop time on it. So never, ever start 3% saline and leave. You cannot say, oh, 30 mLs an hour and leave. Then you will sure get yourself into a lot of trouble. So if you do that, you can avoid many of these, uh, a lot of these problems. Now, measuring serum sodium frequently becomes critical in case of overcorrection. So now we're going to measure it every two to four hours until our goal is achieved. So what's our goal? Let's say that we started with a sodium of 120 and we overcorrected to 135. So what is our goal? Our goal is to correct only to 128. So now we need the sodium to decline from the target of 135 to 128. Once that happens, we can stop. So how do we achieve that? We give 5% dextrose in water at a rate uh, of 3 ml per kilo per hour. So if someone weighs about 60 kilograms, we give about 200 an hour. And uh, we can also give desmopressin 1 to 2 microgram intravenously every 8 hours until the goal is achieved. Again, this is more relevant if the correction, especially, is more than 10 to 12 
mill equivalent per liter per day, or if the initial sodium is really low, below 120. There are two special scenarios that require special attention. We don't want patients to develop osmotic demyelination syndrome. This is likely to happen in certain types of hyponatremia. We talked about risk factors, severe hyponatremia, liver disease, people with hypokalemia, malnutrition. I want to add two scenarios. The first one, hyponatremia due to thiazide diuretics. When we stop thiazide diuretics and we start treatment with a sodium chloride solution, sometimes you get severe water diuresis. Again, you shut off the vasopressin, the ADH, and you start to have severe water diuresis. And then you can overcorrect hyponatremia, and then you can have ODS. So what do we do? Again, back to the uh, stopping the, the 0.9, checking sodium every two to four hours, giving maybe desmopressin in addition to D5W, of course. Patients with primary polydipsia, these patients have very high water intake and very high urine output. What, what are you going to do? Okay, you admit them with hyponatremia, you're going to start them maybe on 0.9 or 3% and restrict their water intake. So now their ADH, their vasopressin is very suppressed, okay? It's very suppressed because of this high water intake. And when, when, you do, when you do water restriction, what are they going to do? They are going to have severe water diuresis and overcorrection. Now, these cases, if you've ever seen one, it is scary. At some point, you say, well, why, why is the patient putting two liters uh, an hour? Do they have diabetes insipidus? And then you say, oh, what? The DI it causes hypernatremia. This is hypernatremia. What's going on? This is, a, this is what I remember happened to me the first time I saw that. So what are you going to do? Well, stop the water restriction, give D5W, give desmopressin, and obviously stop uh, sodium chloride and uh, similar solutions. Now, this way we conclude the lectures on hyponatremia and the management of hyponatremia. I see you in lecture 9. We're going to talk about hypernatremia.